Hello, welcome. We are Gentlemen United and you are in the Man Cave. Welcome to the first installment of the Man Cave. Our discussion topic today will be racism on my career path. As always, for those of you watching the broadcast live on YouTube, please feel free to add your comments in the comment bar. We may select your comment to add to the discussion. Today we've got Bennett Kelly, Montreal. We've got Richard Tate, also in Montreal, and Stanley Paul in Ottawa. I'm Sean Best. I'm your moderator tonight. Uh, Richard's going to be watching for the comments in the comment bar, and Stanley's going to keep us on time, and Bennett's going to make certain that uh, this is an entertaining broadcast. So <laughs> we've all got our jobs ahead of us. <laughs> all right, gentlemen. So uh, the topic today is a an interesting one. It's uh, one that I think is a little bit... Uh, sensitive and controversial, but that's why we take these topics on because it makes them interesting. So, um, but before I do that, uh, get into the details, let's just do a quick round table. Um, Bennett, want to give us a quick intro? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, throughout life, we all choose either a single or multiple career paths. And um, as black men and women coming up, uh, we face certain hurdles that other ethnicities may or may not face. Uh, at least not in the same regard as, as we experience. So what we're going to discuss tonight is uh, the effects, um, the actual incidents that have occurred as we strive to, uh, you know, fulfill our career paths um, and to grow, you know, uh, both financially and uh, the feeling of self-worth that comes with that, being able to make your own money and be your own person. What do we face in terms of racism and bigotry that... Um, other ethnicities may not uh, be privy to as much and how it affects us directly. And indirectly. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Richard, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, that pretty much, uh, pretty much sums it up. Um, today, when I was reflecting on this conversation we're going to have tonight, um, it just hit me that Things have probably changed, uh, or things have changed in some regards um, compared to when we started out uh, back in the days, meaning that um, the workforce has become uh, more diverse um, for people of color and, of course, for women. Um, but that's something to, uh, to follow up on later. I, I'm curious, I'm actually curious to have this conversation with my son over the holidays, because he's out there now, and I'm interested to see how he is, um, or what or what situations he's running into right now in 2016. Okay, that's a that's actually a pretty uh, interesting point because, uh, and I'm glad you raised it, Richard. I'm going to come back to that one in just a moment. The difference between, I guess, uh, the uh, career challenges for millennials versus the career challenges for uh, Generation X and before us. So. Um, we'll come back to that because I suspect that there are certain differences and for them likely very positive differences than uh, than perhaps we've had. Okay, thanks Richard. Let me go over to Stanley. Hey, good evening everybody. Well, yeah, this topic is very near and dear to my heart as as I think it is to all of us. And the in keeping with what Richard uh, stated just now about the, the workforce being different today than how it was when we first started off, is that since most of business in the world today has gone international with the reach of the internet and all the means of communications that we now have, the, the need for diversity is a must in today's um, business world, right? So that's one of the thing, things I see that's really happening on my end. But also, in keeping with the topic of what we have experienced within our careers, one of the things I hope that we'll touch on a bit is the fact of when something we've been wearing this skin tone all our lives so we have come to be i guess you could say to tolerant i don't know if that's the right word but we're, we're so used to, to having to deal with stuff on a regular basis that we can pick up on the subtleness of things when it happens and that when we speak or if we express those feelings to somebody a, ca a caucasian or somebody not of color they might think that we're over, overly sensitive, whereas if I say the same thing to a brother or somebody like such as me, instantly you know where I'm coming from, and you, and we know the subtleties 
of how things happen out there in the workforce that most other ethnicities don't even see. In fact, I want to come back to that as well in, in a minute, some subtleties, um, because uh, I have a couple of thoughts on that as well. Um, but before we do that, let me uh, ask a few questions. I'll start with some, some statistics and then ask some questions, and I'll kind of go around the table, and uh, so if you guys can just keep in your, in your, your thoughts in terms of uh, what you think your response would be, I'll, I'll come to each of you. So let me start with some facts here. In uh, 2013, the United States Census found that America's racial and ethnic minorities made up about half of the under five age group. This means that by 2043, non-white Americans will comprise the majority of the population. So my question to you guys is this. What are the pros and cons of this demographic change? And what do you predict will happen across the employment landscape? What problems will we encounter and how would you address them? Hmm. Well, I would, if I, I would say that first let's, let's quantify something or qualify. We have to differentiate between prejudice, bigotry, and racism. Yes. Okay. Prejudice being a person's prejudging somebody without any reason. Okay. Prejudice can be reversed. Um, you know, when you have, uh, you think about someone a certain way, oh, they're like this, they're like that. And then when you get to know them, it completely turns your, your whole prejudicial attitude on, on end. Well, that's prejudice. Bigotry is a lot stronger than prejudice. Bigotry, bigotry is more of a, like an ingrained, um, more severe mindset, okay? And racism is the system that allows the dominant group to maintain their dominance. Okay, let's be straight on that. Uh, you guys can chime in on it. Um, I think that the changing demographic, it'll get a lot worse before it gets better. Okay, this whole election cycle is actually, in my opinion, uh, the way it occurred, it happened, is largely as a result of the changing demographic and the fear that the that that set of people who are in control for so long know, at least in the back of their minds, that it won't last lo much longer, at least not in terms of numbers. So, I think it'll get a lot worse before it gets better. Uh, um, that's just my opinion. Okay. All right, um, um, Richard. What do you think? I. You know what? It's, it's an interesting uh, thing to think about, and I'm going to put this twist on it. Um, America and Canada. Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily going to get worse here in Canada. I could be wrong, but that's just my take on it, um, especially Montreal specifically, but then that's a whole other can of because we start off with French and English, and then this breaks into um, people of color, per se. So I don't, I don't know. It, here, for us, I don't know necessarily if it's going to get worse compared to what's happening in the States. Okay. All right. Um, Stan. Well, my thoughts on this are that most definitely things are in, for the States, Things are, I don't see things really getting better anytime soon. Uh, the rising of that tide that came up over during, that, during the election is going to stay at a certain peak for a little while. And I think I, I, everybody's starting to say, now you got to give him a chance based on what he does. And I have to say that only what he does right now could start to bring down the, that, 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 that tide that came up through throughout that that election so um certain parts of, of people are just coming out rampantly now and i think yeah that's definitely going to take a toll um in the workforce when you know people are going out for work looking for for jobs getting looking for interviews um time will tell though that's all i can say okay. the opportunity the opportunity to bring things down is going to be now, and if it doesn't start coming down now, it's just going to keep going up. Okay, um, I, on your earlier point, um, I guess this might be somewhat related to this because I didn't mention the fact that um, uh, the uh, ethnic minorities made up about half of the underage five groups. Of course, by the time the twenty forty three rolls around, um, you know, uh, 
non-white people will make up the majority of the population, at least in the, in the United States. And I'm going to make the presumption by extrapolation, um, perhaps also in other Western countries like Canada. Um, question goes back to an earlier comment that was made. Um, I think, Richard, you brought it up about your son. And um, I guess my question at this point is this. Uh, what do you think uh, will be the difference, or will there be a difference, in your son's experience from a, um, a career perspective as it relates to race versus what our experiences were growing up? So he's a millennial. Millennials have a, a very different um, uh, way of interacting, a different way of thinking. They have a different way of doing things. And um, I don't know. I mean, my, my perception really is that they don't, they don't hold to the same racial beliefs to the same degree that perhaps our generation and going back before our generation um, happens to uh, to hold to. So what are your thoughts on that, Richard? Okay, so I can only speak on what I know of, right? And we're gonna, I'll, I will speak about here in Montreal. Um, it's really become, it, it's, and, and each year that goes by, it becomes more and more of a melting pot you just see the diversity when you go down into the court and you see Arabs, uh, Caribbean, Asian, it's just a huge melting pot. Um, then I look at my, my, my son's friends, that melting pot is reflected in the people he hangs out and socializes with, right? That's why I said, I think it's gonna kind of weed itself out and it gets back to what you said, just a numbers game as we move forward that percentage of the workforce is gonna is gonna drastically change right and they and i don't know they're just their mindsets are totally different to when we started out in the workforce where it was very cut and dry when you saw a brother in a place you were like you know embracing him like like there's two or three of us in here you know you're sitting in a cafeteria and you're looking around and go wow this is you give, uh, you give him the nod like <laughs> yeah, like yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, um, un unity in our small numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, try and figure this thing out. Whereas this generation right now, they don't really. I mean, they're just so interconnected with each other, and and, and there's such an embracing of different cultures. And, and I'm only speaking about here. You know, you will have a different experience out there in Atlanta. I don't know, Stanley. You could probably reflect on this in in, in Ottawa. Um, but this is what I'm seeing here compared to when I started out where it was very cut and dry, man. You, when I started working, I mean, it was like, you you look forward to seeing a brother, even a French brother from Haiti. It was like, you know, you know where it's like two or three of us in, in, in this uh, company. Um, my son, I don't think really has that issue, but like I said, I have to have that conversation with him. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, uh, to, to, uh, to answer or to expand on that a little bit, uh, I see the same thing here. Um, I even see with my son and uh, his friends, um, and uh, even in the workplace, because where I work, we have a lot of millennials, and they're, you know, they're early 20s, and um, I watch them interact, how they have, you know, they have lunch. I tease uh, one of the millennials um, that I work with uh, about the fact that, you know, Go and sit on their hold hands and go to the bathroom. They hold hands, you know. <laughs> but the, but in a sense, I mean, I'm poking fun at them, but it's for a good thing, a good reason. Because uh, when you look at them interact, it's irrelevant to them what the color or the race or the background of the other person they're talking to is, because they just it's irrelevant to them. They don't care about that. They 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 interact on the basis of their personality, the the dynamic, uh, the common interests. They don't tend to, I, my experience watching, we have a lot of millennials where I work, uh, don't particularly, the whole race thing, that's almost old news for, for them. That's what their parents uh, pay attention to. Um, so that's kind of been my experience, and I also noticed that with uh, yeah. with, with my son. But um, uh, Bennett, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, like I said before, uh, prejudice um, is based on, Ignorance. I mean, the actual meaning of the word ignorance, lack of knowledge. And by everybody getting together and growing up together, um, that is a very powerful tool to destroy prejudice because you've been exposed to these people. You know, I had a conversation with somebody recently and I looked at them and I said, do you know that every single person on this planet wants the exact same thing? 
You want to be safe. You want to be secure. You want to have a good life. We all want the same thing. And I, 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 I can tell you in Houston, I've been going there for about 18 and a half, 19 years now, and I've seen a difference. Um, it used to be <clears throat> when I started to go, you didn't see the different ethnicities or as some people like to call races. I really don't like to call that for various reasons, but mingling and whatnot. But as you go there now, things are changing a lot. It's the youth that are changing it. I just came back from my niece's Sweet 16 and the, oh, the United Nations were present at their Sweet 16. And they're all together, they're laughing with each other, they're enjoying each other's company. And I think that's the real thing that's going to break down prejudice. And if that's broken down, then bigotry is broken. And then racism has an issue because racism, the majority of it is based on ignorance. You know, how many of these people that scream, uh, you know, this and that about black people or Jewish people or Asian people, but don't have a single friend or have never actually interacted with that the person in a meaningful way, you know? So I think that the youth coming up now, that's the danger. But I got to ask one question with all those statistics, do they take into account mixed ethnicity children or children of different backgrounds? For example, uh, the mothers from Mexico and the fathers from the Philippines and whatnot, or is that included? Because those are not quote unquote white children. Yeah. No. So I'm, I'll get into that in just a, a moment because I do have some stats for you on that one. Um, but before I get into that, uh, let me go to Stanley because I know you're itching to get in here on this one. <laughs> okay, in my case, I tend to see in my, my present company, there has been a major divide. I've been there for 20 years. I, there's been a major change, I could say, in the, in, in the 20 years since I've been there. From the point of when I was first there traveling, uh, let's say, yeah, 20, 19 years ago, and going to different companies, and we're all walking in there on a new contract, and the f one, I'm the only person who's identified, seeked out and asked the question, oh, small talk, and what is your, what is your background? What is your educational background? <laughs> There's four of us in the room, but I'm the one in the room who's asked that. T to the point whereas <laughs> today... I am looking, and within the last, let's say, a couple of um, last half year, the number of minorities uh, or blacks actually went up a hundred percent in my company, and we're bringing in these young millenni millennials, and with very good education, all these guys, are engineers, coming with their masters, and some even thinking of going on for their PhDs, and these are kids in their in the in mid. It was great to see. So we, we went from three to seven <laughs> out, out, out of 500. But still, in my hey, 20 years improvement. there, yeah, in my 20 years there, I've never seen or experienced this. So this is great to see, and they're hungry and they're educated to the T. But the fact is that that's that's what I'm talking about with the diversity in the workforce when I first when we first started talking, right? Mm -hmm. But as you guys have both said, or all three of you have said, yes, the changes are coming with the younger generation. They're so intertwined, intermixed right now that when you see the, the racist tendencies or bigotry tends to prevail, I tend to think, with more of the our age and up. When you, you start know, looking, uh, Go ahead. Go sorry, ahead. Sam. Stan. But as you look younger, they are so into what they could do today for themselves and where they're going, and they don't have time for it. And if they could have a friend here and there who can help them get there, they're working together to go there. You know, totally different than when we were coming up. Yeah. I was uh, joking today. I was uh, uh, teasing someone saying I call them the selfie stick generation. <laughs> um, right? Can't go to it without doing this. <laughs> but um, but uh, the one thing I, I was uh, – I, I wanted to touch on a little bit because uh, Bennett did talk about this was the United Nations effect. And, you know, I know when we were growing up, we didn't have the Internet and Facebook and YouTube and, you know, Internet um, – I mean, um, Instagram. You know, we had rotary phones. We had the push-button phones uh, yeah. at the end there. I mean, I remember we had Pong. Remember Pong, the game where you, you had the two little dials? Uh -huh. And we, you know, so we had we were back in that generation. But I do remember growing up in, in Montreal, um, and it also being like um, a United Nations. My friends were all from 
all over the country, all over the world. Um, that was Dawson, awesome, man. That was Dawson. It was even North Mount High School. I went to North Mount uh, or not Monk, you know, um, <laughs> back in the, uh, in the in the in the early '80s. And it was, I mean, you know, even couples that dated, it was very rare to see same race dating each other. It was very common for people to be mixed. So I don't know that I would say that we started it, but I think. Um, I, I began to see a little bit of that break from, you know, the strong divide between, you know, black, white, you know, Asian, Southeast Asian, and right. so on, beginning in, in that era. But I think that this generation, the millennials, have taken it to a completely different um, place because their interests are not so much in what's your background, what language you speak, what food do you eat. They're more interested in, you know, um, do you play Pokemon Go or are you interested in what, you know, their interests are, are, they have more common interests. I'm kind of poking fun to a certain degree, but um, right. in a good way, because I think the direction that I perceive them to be going in is is the direction that we need to move, to move in. Now, um, the one thing I wanted to touch on as well was, um, is, um, Stan, you, you talked about it a minute, questions about credentials. So, um, and I'm going to refer to this scenario in, um, uh, more because I don't really have a, a personal experience I can think of at the top of my head to say that I I, I can you know relate to this, uh, but um, you know when you watch for example an athletes being interviewed on TV, and uh, I'm sure you guys can relate to this when they're interviewing a you know uh, a white quarterback they're talking about the play that he made and and what he thought about you know the the defense and what he thought his strategy should have been and you know what he thought was the the proper way to, to you know to deal with the situation but you know what's life like and you know um, what kind of other projects you're working on. And then um, I occasionally notice situations where when they're interviewing a black athlete, um, uh, it tends to get a little less formal, um, a little more buddy-buddy. And uh, it's a lot more about, you know, so what do you spend your money on? Um, you know, so what kind of car are you driving? You know, it's, it's all about, you know, do you, are you, um, do you have enough couth to know how to manage your money, and if you do, what do you spend it on? So I can judge for myself if you know what you're oh. doing. Well, oh. huh. <laughs> look at Dallas Cowboys right now. The guy loses a game, and they're talking about, well, maybe he should be on the bench, whatever. Look at Green Bay. How many games did they lose in the beginning? Nobody's talking about, you know, maybe we should have rest the quarterback. You know, I mean, you, you have to perform on a level that's not only higher, but consistently higher, okay? And with respect to being in the workforce, uh, for the hospital job, it, it's no big deal. It's a lot of mixed ethnicities, although there's, that's a whole other bag of worms right there. Um, but in, in the computer world, and as soon as you walk in unannounced, if I just walk in and someone answers an ad, uh, I didn't want to put an ad in the paper for years because I knew I would ha what I would have to deal with. They would look at you at the front door, stand in the doorway of their office or their home, don't want to let you in right away and say, well, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm Silicon Nubian and I'm here for your story. Oh, yeah? So have you done this before? Um, and these are completely computer illiterate people. Have you done this before? Uh, have you seen this before? How many? And you're getting all these questions at the door. So, you know, and my counterparts who are not black don't seem to have that, unfortunately, you know. So this is a situation that I've seen in the workplace uh, many times, many, many times. And also, uh, quickly to add, we did go to Dawson College. And for better or for worse, we were pretty insulated from what was happening out there because Dawson, especially if you went to Selby or you went to La Fontaine, I went to La Fontaine. Remember all the basketball games at the Showmart? Yep. <laughs> remember? Oh, oh yeah, everybody. Remember the Blockos? Remember uh, LDG? All those, you know, Dawson Socials. Everyone was there. It was just pure niceness. And I think for better or for worse, that might have to, had a little bit of a detriment because when you left Dawson and you went to the real world and you had to work, that's not how. That's not what you found. At least not in our area. Right. You see, right. you know, that, I, I like I like that I like that analogy, man. That was uh, that that really true because yeah, I remember all of that too with Dawson, and I, I guess I, I, it was a really, when you stop to look back in hindsight, it's so tw so much twenty twenty. Yeah, it was a great time with our whole community there. So there was a real community spirit. We saw a lot of other people that looked like us. We hung out with a diverse group around, you know, different spots with everybody's click in the cafeteria. But still, we had our community and we had our, each other. 
and then you walk out into that world when you, you know I I, I I'm sorry go ahead Stan. go ahead no I was going to add to that I was going to add to that Stan I think here I think the differentiator here is this in school we are competing with ourselves so no matter how well or how poorly I do it will have no impact on how well or how poorly you do um, and uh, if I do well and you do well that's great if you do well and I don't do well it doesn't really, it doesn't make there's no there's no interaction between the two of us that affects the other individual's performance. Now, in the workplace, we are now competing for resources. We're competing for um, promotions. We're competing for salary increases. We're competing for staff. We're complete competing for, uh, uh, for for budget increases or for budgets. So now our interaction is different. Our interaction now compete, and I think it's in that environment where uh, you know the. Um, uh, the utopian scenario of being in the college campus where you can sit back in the couch in the in the hallways at La Fontaine and crack jokes, um, that goes away because now we have our shirts and ties on, our shoes are shiny, and we're both trying to get the same job. We're trying to get the promotion, and suddenly, you know, that friendly interaction goes by the wayside. It gets, you know, it gets touch on something that Ben just said not too long ago, and I came across something today that kind of drives that point home. Uh, prestige of position does not protect you from racial, uh, sorry, racial microaggression. Meaning you get these, you know, you get these like, kind of like what Stan said, you know, why is he being targeted and asked that question? It's like when I walk into a function or whatever, they will assume that I am not the chef, but I'm one of the cooks, right? Or um, case in point, I mean, when I reflect on my 20 years of cooking and then being executive chef at some establishments, the guy who comes in with the work order because he just fixed equipment, but he's going to my third cook to sign the bill. And the, the cook is looking at him, well, I'm not the chef. The chef is over there. You know, he's even walked past me <laughs> to go to the next guy. And the guy's looking at him and going, no. The black guy over there is the chef, <laughs> you know? It, it, and, and this is, like for me, it, like this whole conversation tonight, it's a little personal because this is what it's been the last 20 years. And you know, you have to keep proving yourself, going above the bar, you know? Um, and the funny thing is like, when I went to cooking school, grad, finished with honors, was invited back to teach, which was just a political thing, of course, because they wanted to have that face to, to show that in the industry, there's representation um, to being honored at that cooking school as one of their top graduates. And then you go into the workforce and you know, you're working for pretty much white Anglophone or Francophone, they've given you the position, but yet you still question and you still have to work twice as hard to get that recognition. You know, so that's me, just the reality. Let me ask you a question. So, and on that note, do you, is it that you feel when you walk in every day that you have to perform on your A game? Or is it that you're constantly being reminded that you need to perform? You, in other words, I guess what I'm asking here is, do you think that that pressure is being put on you by someone else or other people? Or do you feel that perhaps there's a little bit of you putting that pressure on yourself? Um... That's a good question. Uh, I guess at different stages, that could apply. I mean, now it's my place, and I'm doing me, and um, I don't have, I don't owe anyone anything. You're coming to my place. This is what I do, and you either like it, you get it, or you don't. You're right. Um, share a story with you guys, which you, you'll find rather amusing. So, the previous place I was working at. Um, and I've told this story several times and people can't believe it, but here it is. We got a contract to do uh, a dinner for the Case Populaire and they were bringing out all their high profile clients. So the first time we got the gig, the sommelier contacted me, came down, he met me and my sous chef and we went through the whole process of setting up this menu because they were bringing these prestigious clients. So we did the function and it was a success and at the end, you know, it's a very typical French thing that the, the, the cooking team goes into the dining room to present themselves and you're introduced 
and they get up and clap, et cetera, et cetera. So the first time we did this thing, they were blown away by the food. We went out. The bank manager was sitting there, a guy by the name of Mr. Ortiz. And when he, when, when, when he went through, this is uh, uh, the, the executive chef's cook, this is a sous chef, and this is the executive chef, Mr. Richard Ting. The facial expression is too bad I didn't have a camera at the time to take it. It was priceless. We move, we move, we, we go a year for a year forward. The same thing again. They contact us. They want to do this again because their clients absolutely love the experience. They increase the numbers. Same thing again. Knocked it out the park, went into the dining room. Some people clap, some people, whatever. Um, bank manager, still no recognition. Not a thank you. It was a fantastic job. Nothing. So the third year came around and I didn't hear them call. And then suddenly last minute, Serge calls me and he says, Richard, we got to do this one more time. We're bringing about 50 to 60 people. This has to be amazing. These are some really high profile clients. Because I had built up this relationship with this sommelier. And I said to myself, I have to, if the two previous functions were amazing, this one has to be on a whole nother level. I said, I have to bring it, bring the heat. So we worked on this menu. We worked on this menu and we brought the heat. I'm telling you guys, we went out there, every single person in that room stood up and this manager walked across the dining room, grabbed my hand and said, Richard, fantastic job. Took three years. See that? Three, three years. <laughs> to get acknowledged for that. To get acknowledged. He yeah. couldn't wrap his head around that concept that a brother could do that food. Right. Could have been in charge of this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, as, um, I, I guess we'll, I, we can all add our stories here. I have, I have one story in Montreal and another story in Toronto. Um, the one story in Montreal was more, uh, was, um, this is going way back to the break dancing days when I was uh, in my last, uh, uh, last years of high school. We used to break dance in downtown Montreal when that was all Mr. in. Mr. Crew, Mr. Days. Crew. <laughs> yeah, no, it was uh, Sonic Force, man. Mr. So, Crew, Sonic remember Force. Versa? <laughs> yeah, that's my buddy, man. Good boy. Even watching this show online. Um, so, anyways, uh, so we got, uh, I ended up being elected the manager of the group. I don't know why, because I don't know the first one about managing anything. And um, we did some shows. We got, you know, asked by some people who saw us, you know, dancing downtown on a piece of cardboard with a big boom box. And this guy walks by speaking French and he says, Hey, you know, um, I own a, a clothing store, a fashion store in, um, in Placeville Marie. Um, and I would like for you guys to come and do a little show. Cause we're going to, you know, we're going to have you guys sort of, you know, uh, wear the clothes and sort of model clothes and then do some, you know, yeah. <laughs> so anyways, so we went, and the thing is, actually, I take it back. He said this to me in English, so he assumed that I didn't speak any French. So now we went to do this show, and we're, you know, we're doing this show. This is the time when, um, when Michael Jackson just um, uh, launched the the moonwalk. When Billy Jean came out, and he did that the moonwalk. So it was brand new at that point in time. This goes way back. I'm dating myself, right? So, um, so we're up there, we're doing our dance, we're doing the moonwalk. The crowd's going nuts, and it was really cool. And so afterwards, um, he was talking to us and he's in English, and then he leaned over to his friend and he says to him, Oh, ce sont les, les nègres qui dansent. <laughs> and for those who don't speak French, <laughs> those are the niggas that dance. And he was talking about us. And I was like, I don't think he knew that I understood that. Right? So that was my first, at that age, I was maybe 16, maybe my, you know, my son's age, when I first experienced what that was like, right? Um, so that was a, a little bit of a warning shot, you know, this is what the real world is like. And, uh, uh, I'll never forget that. I, I was, in, I was like, did I hear that? And I looked at a friend of mine and says, yep, you heard that. Cause I heard it too. <laughs> so anyway, um, Stan, anything that you want to, uh, uh, that you want to add? Well, as you said, we all, we all have stories, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, at, at this point in time, I, you know, just to say another story for me, I don't see it will take me anywhere because we all, we all have lived them. 
the thing I, I'm, I'm going to look at it from, a, from just flipping the script a little bit is that one of the things that I notice that I feel that happens, and this is some of the subtle subtleties that that's out there, is that there is a certain intimidation in the workforce when you have, especially if, uh, my experience, somebody of my stature, you know, six foot three, two seventy, and and my education, and that poses um, it, it, tend, it potentially can make somebody who who's not very have a lot of self esteem insecure, especially if they're in positions of management. Mm. "Quote unquote power," but the thing that the way how that comes at you though, and you can never prove it, is that when you get to the point where, especially with that, this is the, the 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 negative or the harsh part of working for someone else. When it comes to opportunities, they can find reasons, mm. or yeah, they can find reasons just to not make things happen at the time when they should happen. Even if you've done everything that you need to, that you have done above and beyond, you know, you know, you understand? So that is something I see that is, it's very hard to pinpoint for most. We, when it happens to us, we can say yes, but there's no, there's no way you can ever prove that. And right. I find in the career that's one of the harshest things to deal with. <clears throat> Definitely. So uh, maybe on that that point, Stan, um, a question for you. Uh, in your experience, are there certain uh, subtle cues that um, perhaps somebody who is your peer, but who is who is not black, a, a, a white a white fella or a white lady, um, certain cues that when they are given in a very indirect way in a meeting, that they understand what's really being said. And you ever find that you're, you're sometimes in a situation where you're like, how come I'm not understanding what it is that they're understanding? And I don't, I don't mean it in such a way that they're talking about you, but the boss is implying something, and by implying it, they automatically get what he's trying to say or what he's not saying. And you perhaps may find yourself not really grasping what it is he's trying to say. Do you ever find yourself in that situation? No, I am. No, I've never been. I never found myself in that situation. I, I can't say that. But I, I've been in situations where. The, the the best thing that was that was supposed to be done on a specific project which was discussed with other levels other organizations everybody was okay with the plan that I came up with for a specific project and by the time it got to the manager Another colleague of mine had a totally different idea, which was fine. We all want to bat, out, bat around the right, the, all the ideas to come up with the best, best way. But I already knew my way was the best. Right? Cause, <laughs> cause, no, no, no. I'm not, it's not being, you know, having any ego with it. It's just I just knew because I had already discussed it. I've discussed with the, the engineers uh, from the other company. I, I discussed it with all the software people. So the plan that I had was to limit manpower, limit work, limit, lim just basically limit work and li limit effort. And it was the best option, and the manufacturer signed off on it already. So when this came time to present it, present it to be done, the manager at the time, who was my manager, I remember, I remember doing my presentation the whole half morning. He just sat there and didn't say a word, and just looked. <laughs> In the afternoon, my colleague was doing his presentation. He was all in conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the way how things should be. This is the way how it should go. We're going to go this way. And I said, listen, this is not what was agreed upon. Mm, he didn't want to hear a word. So, you know, to get anything done in this world, you have to be able to play the game. So I went around the back door, even though I know it's right, but I couldn't face him directly on because, hey, I'm a subordinate at that point in time. So I went around, talked to the director. I'll talk to a buddy of mine. He went in software. He went to his director, laid it all out of what was already agreed upon with the manufacturer, and then it came in from that director to the manager I was working for. Then you know, and then know how he comes to me. Oh, you know, Stanley, I was thinking, um, I had second thoughts, 
And you know, I think the way that you that you, you, we're going to go that way, I think that would be the best course of action <laughs> when I come to think about it. Now, and I'm looking at him knowing fully well how I made that happen. Right. And it was the right way. And when I told one of the colleagues who knows that we agreed upon this, he got pissed off and went to his director. Mm. You have to get yeah. the work done. Sorry, huh. Now, what do you think is the reason behind that? I, I want to get this because this is really the topic we're talking about. You know, and do you think that perhaps he had an issue with you because you're black, or do you think perhaps he had an issue with you because he didn't really have a, um, uh, a, a trusting or a, a more of a, a personal type relationship with you uh, versus the other individual who he was, you know, he's clapping hands and thumbs up and the whole bit. Do you think that that person invested more time building a personal relationship with him, even if it's going out for lunch or going out to conferences and perhaps your relationship was, was more just pure business? Was that the case or would you say that that was not the case? The case here was the fact that I was a black male professional who called my manager on a situation when he didn't stick up for me. And I've worked at that point in time, I had worked with him for about six years. And the fact of he heard some, I called, anyways, it was a situation where he should have had my back and he didn't have my back. He's worked with me closely. He's the okay. one who hired me into the company. And the first thing that was negative that he heard about me, he assumed it was the truth versus that somebody might have a vendetta against me. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, and I called him on that. I had a closed door meeting and I said, how long have I worked for you? Blah, 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 blah. We have, I went down through the list and I said, well, so why is it that the first time you hear something negative about me, you don't go to bat for me, but for somebody who works for someone else and you don't even know them, they don't even work for you. You just overbraid them that that person is doing the right thing. And that's what pissed him off that when it came time to this, he just didn't even want anything to do with me. But he still had well, to come back. Right, well, day. you know, you know, there's 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 a lot to be said about we talked about how you have to be you have to perform at just another level. But yes. then when you shine well then when you start to shine too brightly, the backlash can be pretty severe. Mm -hmm. Okay? Oh yeah. It, it's it's severe in all. I mean I work if you work for, I had a gentleman who worked for the Bank of Montreal. Um, he, he basically did a lot of deals. He's the guy that they go to when someone wants to buy a couple million dollar buildings and whatever. He has a whole management team. He sets them up. And it was his mother was a patient at the hospital. And he broke it down. He said, the difference between working blue collar and white collar is on one hand, you have the folks, let's say, working in hospitals or factories. They have no vested interest except to work, do the eight hours, go home, and that's it. In his field, everybody's there to please the manager, okay? When you start to shine, even if that person is the one who brought you in, and people could see that you're starting to shine, they start to panic, and it gets worse. It's, I think, just the color alone of your skin makes it even twice as, well, twice as bad. I don't know what you guys think about that. It's almost like you, you know you have to perform, but when you do perform, the backlash can be very severe. So maybe a question for you, Ben, on that. Um, how important is it to you, or is it important to you? Uh, just kind of building on the last uh, point that I made, then I want to go back to some stats really quickly. Um, to relationship with, uh, with your boss versus, you know, okay, I come in, my job description is X, I work from 9 to 5, I put in my 40 hours a week, I do X on Friday at 5 o'clock, and I, and, you know, I do a great okay. really job, my, you know, I stand out. How important do you think it is to invest time uh, in building a relationship with, um, with your, your boss or your superior, even your peers? Well, um, it's critical. If you don't do it, you're going to have a hard time succeeding. I mean, your, your superior or your manager or your boss or whatever you'd like to call them, um, they have a job to do, and that's managing you. Uh, so you need to have at least a, a rapport with them, okay? But always knowing in the back of your mind that they have a job to do, and uh, in the hierarchy of whatever company you happen to be in, you're a little bit below them. So they call the shots to a point. At that same, uh, on that same token, or the other side of that coin, I should say, 
you need to know where you stand and what your rights are, you know, with respect to your job uh, at all times. And with respect to your coworkers, uh, depending on what you do, you m absolutely must have a rapport. I think Stanley and I think uh, Richard will say, I mean, Richard has a rapport with his staff. Stanley, you have a rapport with your coworkers. And you even have to have a relationship with the same person who didn't stand for you. At least what I really like what Stanley did is he did the professional thing. He was the, is the bigger man. Let's have a private meeting about this. Let's lay it on the table. Nobody's being disrespectful. Nobody's swearing at each other. But I'm going to tell you how I feel. Okay? And that's it. So you do have to have that kind of relationship. I don't, I don't see how you can work in any workplace and not have a relationship with your coworkers or your managers. Um, the worst relationship I ever have is when I work for myself. <laughs> you, get, you know, I mean, at times you you get really upset at your own self. So, you know, you're tired and whatever, and you get fed up. I mean, but at the workplace, it's a balance. You know, it's very political. The workplace is very political. Or it can be. So I mean, that's a good point. So um, let me ask, put this, this question out to the group. Um, political and I think it's a safe thing to say that the politics don't just apply to us because we're black they apply to everybody if you're working in a, in a work in, in an environment with other individuals who you are uh, either competing with or competing for um, uh, there's a certain degree of your job that is associated with knowing how to play the politics do you think that um, where do you what do you think are the pros and the cons for um, for black people in particular uh, when it comes to playing uh, the politics, do you think that perhaps uh, we, uh, generally speaking, uh, perform well? Do we uh, perhaps not understand how the politics work and not perform well? Uh, is it a mix? What are your What are your thoughts? That's a very That's a very individual thing. You have to know your work environment and 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 how the game is being played. Fortunately for me, <laughs> I learned that. The hard way back in the day when I when uh, I was doing working for fast food and worked up to management and um, being in Quebec with French and English and then being black in, in in an organization that had purely francophone management um, like I said I had to bring that double a game know that system inside and out and under and understand that every single promotion they were going to give me it was going to be challenged at every single turn. And uh, that that helped me grow a second skin. And any job moving forward, I, was, I always made a point of understanding what environment I was in and how I had to work within that environment to succeed. It's key. OK. Um. Let me throw another statistic at you guys here really quickly. I uh, know we have, um, by the way, uh, Richard, are there any comments for us on the uh, comment bar? Nothing yet. Quick, I see we have three viewers. Yeah, three viewers, nothing yet. Okay, all righty. Um, in a 2013 survey of over 5,200 newly employed workers, workers were offered significantly less compensation than whites by potential new employers. So my question to you guys would be these two questions. Wouldn't this be best addressed by learning how to negotiate compensation? And two, do you negotiate your compensations during the hiring process? And if so, how do you approach it? Yes, you said it. I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think it has to do, again, with the, the getting better at negotiating the compensation. And I think there's an uh, underlying feeling of, feeling of undervaluing ourselves, okay? So we're walking in the door, we have the experience, we have the education, you know, we have the, you know, we have what's needed to do the position, yet we may walk in the front door and don't negotiate as high as we should or don't know how to do it properly to get the best out, uh, out of what uh, out of what we can get when you're going in the front door. Because if you don't do it going in the front door, you fall into the rungs and you just start going tick, 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 the little inter incremental scale all going up. So I think that's a problem that the majority, I think that's a real good point. Uh, you know, don't negotiate very well. You have to know your self-worth. Exactly. You gotta, you gotta do your research and, and 
and understand that, like you said, Stan, you got to do it when you're going in that front door and you can't undersell yourself. That is correct. You better to push the limit and have a negotiation or a conversation than undersell yourself. Then you have no room to play once you've done that. Exactly. Exactly. Right, you right. you have you have to get in there having done the research, um, and knowing what most others are being compensated. For example, when I was hired at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Cancer Center, the f one of the things they asked me at the end of their interview is, "What do you want your salary to be?" <laughs> and it was an open-ended question, but you see, it was a test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I had already researched and found out what my position would pay for you know the average person and I put myself squarely at the higher end of that level <laughs> but I did it because I had all I had all this experience and and they looked at me and I said yes uh, I'm aware of the salary scale for so and so as soon as you say that they're like oh this guy really did his homework right and I believe that uh, commensurate on my experience and whatever I can you know I'd be happy with this salary to start and uh, you can't undersell yourself because when you undersell yourself, another thing that happens is you, 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 you reduce, you're not, people can't take you as seriously. You know what I mean? When you devalue yourself, other people see you as lower as well. Okay? Let's put it like that. So, I mean, and I, I'll add a, a, a bit of advice that was once given to me that I found to be very helpful. And uh, specifically for those of us who work in uh, industries where you are typically approached by um, by recruiting firms, headhunters, um, and uh, headhunters always ask you, "So, what are you getting paid now?" Right? Because that's their barometer. They just determine, okay, if that's what you're getting paid now, I'm gonna probably I'm gonna make certain that what you get offered is about that. I'm making a margin, so I'm gonna put you in at this level. You're gonna get paid this much. I'm gonna get this margin. This, this now I know how much I can make out of this deal. And a friend of mine once told me this. He says, "Whoever says a number first loses." <laughs> yeah, that's one. Of the, yeah, and that is one of the best things in ter in terms of negotiating. Like, what you getting paid now? But most people would defer to answer. So when I've been approached, I mean, usually they'll come at me, and if there's something that's of interest, after there's a little bit of communication back and forth. What they have done was, okay, well, this this position comes in at this rate with this much bonus and is that something to be okay with and i said all i would say is um well, at least you're in the ballpark right you're in the ballpark mm. there's no way in the world i'm saying yeah that's fantastic no because it's not because i know exactly and i, I looked at one position just in this case i looked at one position and i knew exactly what was going on the market and they were like 13k yep. below if for somebody of my background experience Come, would come in at it's a test. and what I bring to the table. Mm. It don't talk numbers, you, but you have to know your self worth and you have to know how to how to speak to speak to speak when you're when you when you're doing those things when you're negotiating. And it is a skill set. It is a that skill can, set anybody, that anybody. It's can a, it is a skill set. The other bit of advice that I would be given was that um, when you're in this conversation, this negotiation back and forth, try to defer conversation about salary as long as you possibly can. Because when they first meet you, you're just the face that was that's behind that resume. Um, what they need to do is they need to get to fall in love with who you are as a person, what you bring to the team, and to really buy into you know not just your personality but what your skill set really is when they've had a chance to interact with you. The more that they start to feel that you are that candidate, the easier that that conversation gets at the at the end. If you come in, in my opinion, Mike's and my experience because I was a consultant for ten years, and I have to do this over and over again. If you come in in the first conversation talking dollars, you're already lo you've already lost the conversation. You've already lost it. I mean, yeah. you may get the deal, but you're gonna you're selling. You've already sold yourself short because you know they had a number up here in their mind, and you came in here thinking I'd be happy to get this, and you've just sold yourself out. That and to your point, Stanley, once you're in, you know your incremental raises are. You just got a two point three percent increase this year. That's a great increase. I mean, you're not gonna get a forty eight percent increase. It's not gonna happen. So. Uh, if you don't negotiate it on the, coming in the front door, you're not going to get that unless you leave and go somewhere else and then renegotiate again there afterwards. I'm sorry. Uh, I think, Richard, you're going to say something. No, I'm just going to touch on what you said. You're 100% right. You know, it's talk, let's talk about the job description, what you need, um, 
And then I kind of just let them tell me what um, that position or, or, or what they're looking to offer. And I already have my number in my head. And we're going, well, now I'm an owner, so the game has changed, right? But that's how I would always approach it. But I would never, ever sell myself short. But that comes with experience, too. I mean, it gets yeah. to a certain point. As you get older, you learn. And you know what? You're, why should you give away your expertise or what you're going to bring to the table? You know? Exactly. You know, and I think to a certain degree, not knocking my parents, I love them to death, and they did the best they could for me. But I don't know. Obviously, coming from a different culture and a different background and a different, different generation, um, I never got that that, um, uh, that advice from them. This is something I had to learn on my own kind of the hard way. And look, I'm not thinking it's a black or white thing. I think it's just, it's a generational thing. Yeah. Um, uh, really quickly, one last thing before we start to wrap up here. Uh, there's one other question I wanted to ask. Um, just bear with me for a second. I had it here in front of me and okay, here it goes. This one's going to be an interesting one. I read this article um, or I watched a TED talk uh, uh, this weekend. In an article by Stephanie Votza titled, The Future of Work, Why Everyone's Salary Should Be Revealed, she quotes David Berkus, who in his TED Talk said, quote, when people don't know how their pay compares to their peers, they're more likely to feel underpaid and maybe even discriminated against. I guess my question to you gentlemen is this, do you think that this would address pay inequity? Should everyone's salary be revealed? Why or why not? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. No. No. Stan? No, I don't believe so. No. I, you know, I, when I heard that, I was thinking to myself, and anybody who's a millennial <coughs> watch this, don't take offense, but that sounds like millennial mentality to me. Hey, what are you getting paid? Are you getting that? Oh, I'm getting this. <laughs> you know, I, I, and I think if you, the TED Talk, I'll include the link to the TED Talk in, in the low bar so people can watch and have their own points of view. Um, but, uh, you know, Look, we live in, in my opinion, I agree with you guys on this as well. I think, I, you know, no, no one here has, a, has an opposing point of view. But, you know, we live in a capital-driven um, economy. And in a capital-driven economy, people will not get paid the same for the same job. You're going to get paid what you negotiate. And that's how it works. Um, if you are interested in getting paid, in my opinion, if you're interested in getting paid exactly what the guy next is getting paid for doing exactly the same job, then you are working in the wrong country. You need to go work in China, go work in uh, some communist country, <laughs> go work in, in North Korea where they'll give you the same rations that they're going to give your neighbors. But that's not how things work in a, in a capital-driven uh, capital society. That's just my point of view, guys. What do you think? Question for you, Sean. Oh, yeah. Did I, I, and I should, have printed, I should have printed it today. Um, it was, uh, I think, a study or just, a, just some numbers on... Um, Similar jobs in the in the United States. Uh, let's just I just throw out an example. Let's say an accountant, uh, a white Caucasian man would be making X amount of dollars. A black male, same position, there'd be a discrepancy of ten or fifteen percent, and then so forth, so forth for a female worker holding the same position. I don't know. Is that those numbers still? Uh, well, I have very, I have a very um, strong belief about that. That may go counter to what you might expect me to say. So, okay, um, and that kind of goes back to the the discussion we talked about, which had to do with negotiating compensation. So, when we talk about pay equity between you know uh, white um, employees and black employees, uh, men versus men, um, certainly, yeah. Look, what people may offer you coming out of the gate. Uh, I guess it depends on the, the line of work that you're in, but the line of work that I'm in, I'm a hiring manager. So, so when a position gets posted, I get my position requisition. I know what the position requirements are. I know what the salary range happens to be. And that's before I have any resumes in front of me. So I don't know who, if I'm going to hire, it, the person I'm going to hire is going to be black, white, uh, Southeast Asian, male or female. I have no idea who that person is or those people are gonna, that person is going to be before I have that salary range in front of me. Right? Okay. Salary range now gives you an opportunity to negotiate. So the job is on you now to negotiate. Number one, to know what your worth is in the marketplace, and number two, to negotiate. So when you come in the front door, male, female, black, white, uh, whatever the case might be, um, the job is it's on you to sell me on why you know 
why you should be paid or should be offered this compensation. And it isn't just for the salary. Compensation includes it depending on what your what you know level you come in at. It can include stock options. It can it can include a bonus. It can include uh, certain special benefits. It can you know it can include all sorts of different things. A, a vacation package. All that's part of compensation, right? So uh, when you ask me about you know uh, the pay and equity, and we can have a whole other discussion about that. Um, specifically as it relates to male versus female um, because no serious economy economist in the world uh, quotes that 77 cents per dollar um, um, pay inequity or, or pay gap it's 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 non-existent it doesn't exist um, and there's no evidence that it does exist but we can talk about that in a whole other <laughs> a whole other uh, uh, hangout okay guys we are at about 10 o'clock here uh, any other final um, uh, comments before I wrap us up here <clears throat> One thing I can say is that I think you know, in most in most of our topics, I mean, we're always just skimming the the, the the tip of the iceberg here. I mean, there's so many different silos that we can delve and drop into to dig off on into different of all the different type of experiences that we have in the workforce out there today. So. Once again, it was a good, it was a good broad-based conversation, and um, like I said, when we do a, a return down the line, we can pick one of these and just do a deep dive in, even into just one specific topic within any of these topics that we talk on. Well, that that would be great. In fact, thank you. Now, I think that's I agree with you on that one, Stan. It's, it's hard to really delve into anything in an hour, especially in a topic as broad as this one happens to be and all the breadth of experience here. So, you know, I'll keep my eyes open on the comments. Richard, if you can uh, do the same as well, let me know if you've seen anything after yep. this goes live. And uh, if anybody has recommendations on what part of this particular topic they want us to delve down and get into more detail on, I'd be more than happy to, uh, you know, we can certainly entertain that as a, as a, as a team and, um, and really dig into that and get some meeting on that. Um, talk to your uh, kids. I'm gonna yes. talk, I'll be talking to my son over the holidays. I'm, I'm really curious to hear what he has to say on this topic, just out of curiosity. Well, I, you know, maybe we can uh, we can have that conversation and see, uh, see if that's a whole other um, hangout, what the millennials are experiencing in the workplace as it regards, as it relates to uh, um, being black and competing in the workplace. Um, Bennett. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's next to impossible because of the kind of subjects we're picking to even, like Stanley said, we barely scratched the surface. But what I think we're doing, which is a very positive thing, is we're spurring thought. You know? Yes. And this is, this is where everything starts. And um, folks, it's, 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 it's going somewhere. It's definitely going somewhere and it's going very fast and it's good. It's a controlled kind of madness, but it's going very fast, <laughs> you know? So... It's wonderful that, you know, you spend the week thinking about uh, our conversations and you're actually thinking about it. So it's spurring thought. It, it's giving food for thought. And what uh, I've said this before and what I'm really encouraged about is even though we're all different people and not all of us hung particularly in the same circles, although all of our circles did overlap, uh, to, to come to this point of life and realize that we have so much in common. Uh, this is very encouraging to me. True, true. And I'm glad you put it that way, Bennett, because that's, I think, the point <coughs> of all this, and that is uh, there are people watching this who don't know us, who aren't from Canada, who might be from Nigeria, who might be from Australia, who might be from Moscow, uh, and may say, you know, wow, you know, I kind of have something in common with these guys, and I don't even know who they are. And that's really, the, I think, the point behind all this, and that's to generate conversation to create a positive narrative, to say, hey, you know, I know what that feels like, and by the way, I learned something tonight, or perhaps I have something I'd like to contribute that they didn't even say, that they didn't know, and I think the whole world should have an opportunity to hear this. So, uh, again, you know, um, just helping to create, a, th I think, a positive narrative that isn't just about griping about, you know, what isn't working for us, but how do we get around these obstacles, and what can people take from our experiences, and what can we take from each other's experiences uh, to press forward and achieve the things that we want to achieve in life. With that said, if you have any discussion topic ideas that you would like to see us tackle, please tweet your ideas to at GentlemanUnite6. That's at GentlemanUnite6. See the low bar for any references to source materials and other useful links. Please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. 
Thanks for joining Gentlemen United in the Man Cave. Enjoyed the show? Like, share, and subscribe. And thanks for joining us in the Man Cave.